Hello comrades and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party. So today we're joined by Daniel Morley, who is a writer and an activist for the Revolutionary Communist Party, who has recently written an article on the question of Marxists, elections and, and parliaments. And so yeah, we're going to be discussing that question today in light of uh, Fiona Lally's very successful campaign in the constituency of Stratford and Bow. So hi Daniel, how's it going? Yeah, very well, very uh energized by the campaign yeah yeah me too what was your favorite aspect of taking part in the uh, in the campaign just uh you know being on the streets and getting a reaction from people unlike we've ever got before really or, or a gre- at a greater scale than ever before we've had people coming up to us that every time you do it there'd be people who'd uh, who'd heard of us and who you know were really excited about mm. what what we stand for and about Fiona's campaign or about her interview or her her debate shall we say with with Swella Braverman if you can call it that it was more like a thrashing really yeah. wasn't it <laughs> yeah. but yeah that's that's amazing because normally you know when you're a revolutionary activist you you always get people who like your ideas every time you go out on the street but that sort of recognition mm. is not or has not been normal but it's, it's also a sign of changing times really mm-hmm. well actually i guess that leads us straight on to our first question then really which i think you deal with at the start of your article uh, which is by the way available on communist.red um so yeah what was behind our decision as the rcp uh, to stand fiona in the election and to support uh, her campaign what was the thinking behind that mm-hmm. there's two reasons uh, the first one i would say is the sort of relatively accidental or you could say subjective part of it which is in other words to do with our situation as an organization and uh, fiona's position that is to say that fiona was invited onto gb news to debate swella braverman and as you said she absolutely thrashed her and that went really really viral and then of course a few days or a week later the election was announced which of course we weren't expecting so there was an element of fortune there uh, but of course, that that reflects necessity. Mm. First of all, it reflects the fact that we had grown as an organisation quite substantially. That's why we were invited on uh, as a representative of of the sort of pro Palestine movement and the encampments at universities. And that wouldn't have happened five years ago. We've grown a lot as an organisation, right? So that's yes, that was a re- relatively fortuitous, you could say, but mm. actually. And also just the, the, the ability of Fiona to do so well it reflects the power of our ideas and, and the whole method mm-hmm. of our organization of training our comrades up over many years in theory and discussion so that they know what they're talking about, essentially. Uh, so even that relatively accidental thing reflects a sort of deeper process. Mm. But the other uh, consideration, ultimately the, the more uh, substantial one, is the the objective situation in society we have an unprecedented uh volatility in politics and an enormous discontent particularly amongst young people you know we had our are you a communist campaign over the last uh, year which was predicated on this massive support for the ideas of communism amongst young people up to a third of young people say that that's their preferred or the better economic system. So there has been a real radicalization of the youth. There's also unprecedented uh, mistrust of politicians. A recent Ipsos Mori poll showed that I think just 9% of people now trust uh, politicians and just 2 or 3% of people, young people, trust politicians. Mm. And it was also about 2 or 3% of Londoners trust politicians. I don't know why it's so particularly low in London. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that... There's, and I mean, I could multiply this at will, but there's 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 clearly not only enormous discontent, but there's also a breakdown of of nor- the norms of bourgeois democracy, you could say, uh, and that's been reflected in the election result uh, that you had the lowest vote share ever going to the two main parties. You had you know, Labour winning this colossal landslide, but actually on the smallest vote as a proportion that any uh, party that has won a majority ever got. Uh, you've had, you know, Starmer is already massively distrusted. There's, there isn't that honeymoon period, or there won't be. There is, there's, you know, the ho- all politicians essentially, by which people mean really capitalist politicians, mm. which is what all the main, you know, for a very long time now, 
it's been very obvious to people that Labour and Tory are very fundamentally pro-capitalist, you know, politicians. Or people don't necessarily put it in those words, but they would see them as dishonest careerists, essentially, mm-hmm. uh, not people from the working class. And there is there hasn't been anyone uh, in mainstream political life. Uh, really at all who sounds like they are working class and who fights for the working class so there's this enormous alienation from the, from the parties uh, and discontent and and of course we are trying to connect particularly to the to the youth and trying to the main thing for us is not to win the seat although we you know we, we, we led a very bold and, and dynamic campaign trying to get as many votes as possible but the main thing was to to build an organization, to mobilize people and to recruit people, particularly young people radicalized by the war in Gaza, which of course is the other major factor in this. The war in Gaza, which is also why Fiona was uh, debating Suella Braverman. The war in Gaza has obviously further radicalized the young people and away from the Labour Party as well because mm-hmm. of their position. Uh, and that's not going away either. So that all of this kind of came together in this very particular situation. and because of the timing of the election and just so soon after that video of Fiona's went viral, it all kind of came together and just made sense for us to do it, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned a few statistics there about the sort of growing distrust in, in politicians and in the sort of political establishment, if you will. And yeah, obviously, it's, it's easy to refer to these, you know, uh, abstract figures and so on. But this is something that Comrades report finding on the ground, this mood of, of, of apathy or disgust, really, to put it in, in a better way. I remember myself, I was door knocking in, in, in uh, Bo, which is uh, part of the constituency. Um, and yeah, we came across a, an, an older woman who was beset by uh, health problems and so on. She was doesn't really get out that much. And we said, oh, you know, we're, we're supporting an independent candidate in the election, uh, Fiona Lali. And she turned around and she said, oh, I don't do politics. Uh, you know, I hate, I hate politics. All those politicians are the same. And she was about to slam the door in our face. And then uh, luckily I was able to squeeze in, you know, we agree with you. Yeah, the politicians are all the same. You know, they all represent capitalism. They're all carrying out attacks on working class people. And suddenly her entire demeanor changed and her face lit up and she was willing to hear what we had to say. And we talked about our program to save the NHS and, and so on, expropriating the rich, workers control. And yeah, she, she was completely behind it. Uh, and she actually ended up buying a paper for ten pounds, which I think was uh, was really good. I think this is a good uh, illustration of how, you know, what might appear on the surface as apathy or, or disengagement, actually uh, kind of um, yeah disguises what really is a burning anger that's bubbling under the surface in society. And I think actually, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well. Uh, there are other parties as well who are trying to tap into this anti-establishment mood, perhaps in a more demagogic uh, way, like Reform UK, for example. Maybe yeah. do you want to chat about that a little bit before we move on. Yeah. I've, you know, Reform UK is just the latest iteration in that kind of politics and in particular of Nigel Farage. And I've, you know, looked at that over the years and the question of anti-immigration as well. And it's always been the case that whole time, but more so than ever, it's been the case that this this question is a sort of, um, I mean, it's, it's always been a distraction tactic, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, anti-immigration politics. And it's always been a very uh, misleading thing because... You know, you, you look at these parties and their program, not only on the question of immigration, but the program economically is usually very right wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reform UK's is and the Brexit Party and UKIP beforehand had a sort of, you know, uh, really like tax cutting, uh, private, pro-privatization program. And yet the support is totally different from that. It's mm-hmm. not at all made up of people who want those things mm. and they by and large have no idea that the party stands for it and uh and this is quite a well-known phenomenon but it's not it's still not fully uh taken into account of right people still see oh a big vote for reform and that means pe- pe- people are attracted to right-wing politics mm. and people have a low level of consciousness yeah. they're reactionary etc uh which is completely wrong i think that the the main thing about reform and about Nigel Farage, and it's nothing particularly unique to him or to Britain, is, yeah, this posing as anti-establishment. And that, again, that's known and that's talked about a lot, but what's really not grasped about that is, is how people like him come across as, as fighters, mm. right? Uh, people always like say, why is, well, right? yeah, yeah, why, why is he so charismatic? Why? Well, okay, so there's personal elements to it and he's, he's a bit more off the cuff in the way he speaks but the main thing is they come across as fighters and this 
this anti-establishment thing of being prepared to say it like it is, as people like that would would say, uh, is they they get that aura because they, unlike the other politicians who always appear to be saying uh, sort of the right thing in inverted commas, in other words, not trying to get themselves into trouble and carefully calculated and all of that, and basically will never change anything. Um, that's the impression that they give, right? Mm-hmm. Rightly. Uh, whereas Farage comes across as if he doesn't care what the establishment will say. And in fact, he will rail against it. He will attack them. If he's attacked, he won't back down. He won't do as he's told, if you like. Uh, and that tells working class people who are sick of this politics, which doesn't represent them, which cuts you know, everything basically and privatizes and just leads to worsening of living standards. And it's full of liars. And they see someone who they, they I mean, they I think a lot of them probably don't even really believe in him either. I think a lot of voters for reform, they wouldn't re- they don't really think, well, yeah, if reform got in, what would happen is we'd, we'd have a fantastic country. I think most of them just think, you know, basically this, it's like throwing a grenade into parliament. And it's like, here's a man who kind mm. of, who uh, is prepared to, to, to rip everything up basically mm, mm. and it's just an it's an angry thing. and if there was a particularly an article in the in the guardian which interviewed a bunch of reform uk supporters i think in the outskirts of manchester or greater manchester and uh, all of them when they were interviewed they, they're saying very left-wing things they're saying they hate you know the billionaires they hate Su- sunak's a billionaire how can he how can he understand us they described starmer as a red tory they're sick of the profits of multinational corporations and the energy companies in particular. Mm. I mean, that is class content. That's that's working class consciousness there. Mm. It's and been it, distorted. It's been totally time, distorted. Yeah. And I, I, again, I suspect that a lot of those, if you actually asked them, would you really think that Nigel Farage is, is, is going to f- fight against the energy companies? They'd probably say, no, not really, but he's something different. And basically, at least he... You know, it, it it just, it reflects the fact, the fact that they would probably say that reflects what? It reflects that they think that bourgeois democracy is a sham. Mm. So you may as well vote for somebody who at least basically screws around with it and basically mm. says F off to him. <laughs> <laughs> that, and they enjoy the fact, I think, a lot of people, they enjoy getting to vote for someone who is officially bad if you like yeah. he's got official he's officially sort of uh a bit naughty you know what i mean because it's like well it they not because they are necessarily racist and they want racism but because they're like oh well here's someone who who um you know it's basically screw you to to that kind of s- cynical hypocritical politics and um compare that to, to jeremy corbyn Mm. Who we have to say also did very well in a sense. Like you can see that, compare that to what uh, Starmer got in the vote. Got way more votes than Starmer actually in both elections. So, you know, Corbyn did tap into a lot of anger as well. We shouldn't sort of, you know, we should remember that. And obviously particularly amongst the youth. But what did, what was Corbyn's main approach when he was attacked by the establishment for being, you know, supposedly racist, anti-Semitic? Um, or being soft on on anti-Semites. What was his, his reaction was was basically to apologize. He didn't come out swinging and say, these these people are liars, this is a sham, this is a campaign to to get rid of someone like me who stands up for ordinary people because, you know, the establishment Mm. wasn't. He didn't didn't style himself in that way at all. And so if you're uh, a very disenfranchised person um, who's basically seen their living standards fall and perhaps the, the area they live decline. And then you see someone like that who, who then just sort of basically does what the establishment tells them to do, you know, or sort of you know, gives in to their pressure. Mm-hmm. You think a couple of things probably, I think they tend to think, well, he's a bit pathetic. Um, and actually he is more of the same. He, he came, came across to such people also as quite sort of middle class and just sort of a bit pleasant. Whereas what they want is a fighter. They want someone who will take on this nasty establishment. And he didn't really manage to come across in that way. Um, he was more preoccupied with appearing to be nice. His whole motto was a, a, was it a, a fairer, kind of gentler, kind politics. Of gentler yeah. politics. And I think that was very misguided on his mm. part. Yeah, no, I think those were all very, uh, very good points. 
And yeah, I mean, I want to um, yeah fast forward then to the uh, to Fiona's campaign, um, and yeah, which I think was an enormous success, as you, as you said earlier. I mean, uh, aside from the, the vote count, which was you know ne- nearly two thousand votes across the constituency, which by the way I think is is, is fantastic. That means two thousand people who were you know supportive of an openly mm-hmm. revolutionary communist program, talking about you know democratically planning the economy uh, and so forth, expropriating mm-hmm. the banks. And whatnot. This wasn't a watered down kind of opportunist program whatsoever. So we had that. We had two thousand votes, but more than that, you know, we had uh, hundreds of people sign up to to, to support the campaign, to volunteer, uh, or ten thousand pounds in donations. And more importantly, now we've got you know dozens of people who are you know in the process of joining the party. New branches being uh, planned as we speak. So I want to ask you, why do you think it is that uh, Fiona's campaign, Fiona's message? was able to connect so well with a certain layer of people in that constituency and beyond. What was the secret behind it, do you think? <laughs> it was, the main thing was it precisely that it was so bold and revolutionary. Mm. The received wisdom on the left, uh, on the far left, is basically that if you want to break through, if you want to win a seat in parliament or launch a, 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 new, a party that gains s- some sort of foothold in the working class, the received wisdom is that what you have to do is basically water your ideas down to some extent. As a couple of examples, you had, uh, what was it, Left Unity, which uh, was formed on the back of an appeal by um, Ken Loach. I think it was just before Corbyn became a leader of the Labour Party, so about 10 years ago. And uh, the idea was, look, we all need to get together and form a new party um, to replace the Labour Party because that's become really right wing. Uh, and the and most of the people involved in this were ostensibly Marxist revolutionaries, but the program they adopted was a left reformist program. You know, clearly to the left of the Labour Party, yes, but it did not call, talk about revolution. Did not style itself in that kind of bold way. Mm. It certainly didn't use a hammer and sickle or anything like that. It was left unity, a bit vague. That's the that's the sort of approach. And there's been so many examples of this. They got the. Tr- the Tusk Trade Union Socialist Coalition, we had the Socialist Alliance in the early mm. 2000s. They all pursued that approach. Basically, let's fuse together different far left forces under a common banner of left reformism. And uh, and in that way, maybe we will be able to be seen as more realistic uh, and more sort of, you know, acceptable for, for working class people. And then we, and then we'll be on the path because then we'll get that support. That's the idea. Now, I think that's always wrong for various reasons, <clears throat> which I won't go into right now because it's, it doesn't relate specifically to that question. But specifically today, in today's time of this burning anger, this you know, this uh, anti-political mood you could say exists. I think that the boldness of Fiona's campaign. Really, uh, and, and in other words, the overtly communist character of it. We used the hammer and sickle. You know, okay, she stood as an independent formally, but it was very, very strongly shown to be an RCP candidate, right? Mm. So that did never seem to put people off. In my experience, canvassing, I didn't really. Of course, not everyone supported her, right? But the, when people didn't support, when people said, "No, I'm not interested," uh, in one way or another. It was in the same way as they would have said that if we just called it a socialist campaign, right? Mm. In other words, they just were like, no, you're too left wing, you whatever. Um, people, in other words, people who are just would reject the left entirely. Of course, you've got those people. But everyone who was at all supportive loved the nature of the campaign. Mm. They weren't like, oh, that's, I would support you, but it's just a bit too extreme for mm. me. I, ne- I ne- never once heard that. Yeah, I mean, and, the- you know, we... Uh, the vote that we got was better than uh, these other candidates who put up this kind of watered down um, program. And, you know, I I think the way the, the campaign came across to these people is like, this is a breath of fresh air. It's totally different. Of course, it also, the, Fiona herself comes into this, that she's a young, uh, dynamic woman who's very articulate. That helped, of course. And again, I said that's not an accident. That reflects our ideas and the work mm-hmm. of our organization over a long period of time, the education that we we have. But but it, it came across as like, yeah, 
obviously very dynamic campaign, very unafraid to say the truth, you could say. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, the, the, the debate with Swilla Braveman fed into that. Here is someone who sees this hypocritical cast of politicians and just says, basically, to hell with a lot of you. We need something fundamentally different. And that means we need to plan the economy. We need to take on big business. We need to nationalize the key parts of the economy and put it under democratic workers control people are open to that Mm -hmm. right a lot of people are very open Mm -hmm. to that and the main reason they don't vote for something like that is not because they're too scared of it but it's because nobody credible puts that forward Mm -hmm. um and and so obviously there there isn't even an option to vote for that in the vast majority of seats and even if there is it's some minuscule party with no 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 members so they've never heard of it but he, we've built something here we've built okay well obviously we're not a mass party but we've built a sizable organization full of enthusiastic young people who know what they're talking about and fiona is the best example of that and we were able to me- we were able to go out in our numbers and make the case for revolutionary ideas in an unabashed way and that was really appealing to people right mm-hmm. yeah i think what you've said there is summed up in one of the main slogans of Fiona's campaign, which was, uh, yeah, we're not politicians, we're revolutionaries. I think yeah. that really definitely uh, struck a chord. Um, but yeah, I, I want to move on then to um, a part of your article, which you recently wrote, which deals with the question of what, uh, you know, uh, Marxist thinkers from, you know, Marx, Engels, mm-hmm. Lenin and so on, and, and the Bolsheviks, what their approach was to, uh, yeah, running in elections. Because mm-hmm. I think there is a bit of confusion on the left as to whether running elections is a good thing. You have on one hand the kind of ultra left attitude, which we can get into in a bit, you know, that all election or all uh, electoral politics is bad uh, and therefore we shouldn't touch uh, elections with a barge pole. Mm -hmm. Then you have the other side, which is, you know, a fetishization of uh, parliamentary politics and so on. But yeah, what is the, let's start with the question of what is the the classical orthodox Marxist approach to, yeah, to elections and and how to use them? Yeah. It's very interesting because it's that is our approach, and it shows that that has always been the, the the position, which is to essentially see elections primarily as a way of getting revolutionary ideas out there to a bigger audience. It's ne- never been about winning seats first and foremost. Not to say that Marx, Engels, or Lenin were opposed to winning seats in bourgeois parliaments; they they were they were in favour of that. Mm. But that wasn't their main. The main thing was not let's do everything we can to win a seat or to win as many seats as possible. And therefore let's potentially water down our program or come across in a, a kind of, as a professional, you know, come across as like a, a sort of a respectable politician. And then maybe we can insert some some revolutionary stuff into that afterwards. That was never the approach, right? So Marx and Engels wrote uh, about how, you know, the communists should stand in elections where possible. And they, they specifically said, even when they don't really have a chance of winning or when you know they're not yeah they're not they don't have the forces to win they should stand in the elections of course at the time of course the franchise was also restricted so it was very unlikely that they would win and yet they were in favor of it because they said basically we it's a chance to speak to more people and in a more authoritative fashion in other words they recognized that of course, their starting point was that parliament is a, is a, is a sham there's no such you know bourgeois democracy is not real democracy and we want to, you know, uh, smash the bourgeois state. Of course, that was their their position. <clears throat> but that's just the that's just the beginning of the position. You then need to understand your mm-hmm. tactics. And they they said that, um, you know, the, the reality is that working class people do look to parliament uh, at least sometimes. There is a tension, basically, and heightened political awareness that takes place around elections, mm-hmm. and therefore. We should take advantage of that and stand and use it as a kind of platform to denounce parliament or to denounce capitalism, or, you know, to put forward our ideas in one way or another to, and to come across as revolutionaries and to, to basically let the working class know that there is this revolutionary tendency or party that mm-hmm. you could join. Um, that was their position. Lenin then later, of course, uh, this was in a time when you know further on in history and the working class had and gained more experience and developed particularly in germany and the, the position of lenin was and the bolsheviks was to stand for parliament in fact they what they won positions in the duma which was the russian parliament i mean it, it wasn't always the case there were times when they, they boycotted parliament and of course it was a real sham parliament back there because it was under czarism it was just a rubber stamp uh, thing but 
interestingly, even when it was at its most powerless, mm. there were times when Lenin said that they should stand for parliament, at least for the first round of the elections, then maybe withdraw afterwards. Because for the same reason, workers look to this. And we've got to, we can't boycott ourselves from that, essentially. So they were in favor of doing it. And, um, uh, and when they were actually won seats, which they did, it was still with that same ethos. In other words, not to have illusions in a democratic institution. Or You still see that today. And you see these kind of left reformists today talk, you know, the likes of Corbyn or Mélenchon uh, mm -hmm. will, as soon as they get close to power, or you know, they win a few seats, they start talking about the need to sort of restore faith in democracy. <laughs> and uh, isn't this a good thing? You know, this has been discredited by bad politicians, mm -hmm. but we, isn't it fantastic that we've got this democratic process and <laughs> we live in a democratic country? And in other words, spreading illusions in it. Um, mm -hmm. They think it's a clever thing to do because they think that, well, if we if we do that, then we will be able to... to uh, show ourselves as the sort of serious gen mm. you know serious sort of respectable people and we can then you know having then gained that aura of prestige we then we have more legitimacy to put forward left-wing uh, mm. uh policies because never never works that way but lenin's position was no you get into parliament and of course you can use that to achieve some some reforms for the workers but the main thing is to constantly realize you're in the enemy's chamber and to expose it, to use your your the prestige, if you like, of the parliamentary seat as a bigger, as like a, a, a loud hailer, you know, as a bigger mm. voice to say and to expose from within, this is the, the scandals that go on in parliament. This is how hypocritical the parliamentarians really are. These, this is the chicanery and the, the sort of horse trading and the cynical kind of, this is how, you know, the workers are sold out basically. Um, and to, to expose it and to become a, a, a revolutionary uh, leadership in that way, that was their their method. And that's we see ourselves as very much in that tradition. Mm -hmm. And the thing that the uh, the Bolshevik Duma deputies used to do as well was spend a lot of time doing extra parliamentary work as course, well. Yeah. You know, going into the working class neighborhoods, uh, you know, listening about the concerns of of, of you know of workers and and, and women and mm. so on, and then taking that back to the Duma, uh, speaking about it, exposing it, and so on, mm -hmm. and getting that uh, reprinted in the yeah. in the Bolshevik press and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's all very good, but I I want to play devil's advocate for a second and. Yeah, kind of put forward one of the arguments that perhaps uh, an ultra left uh, uh, person uh, might, might say, mm -hmm. which is that you know, isn't it true that um, you know parliaments are a tool of of, of class oppression, yeah. uh, and isn't it true that we've seen parties in the past who you know took part in, in parliamentary politics? I'm thinking, for example, the the SPD, the, the German Social Democratic Party, which was of course at the time the the, the biggest workers' party uh, in the world in the, in the Second International, around about the sort of end of the 19th century. Uh, early 20th century you know, that was a huge party uh, which had you know many uh, MPs if you will or, or deputies whatever you want to call them and yeah that party degenerated and in fact that degeneration was concentrated uh, largely within the parliamentary section of the party with the the MPs and so on who of course in 1914 uh, infamously voted for the war credits you know backing German imperialism in, in, in the first world war so you know taking you know taking that all into account isn't it true to say that you know there are enormous dangers associated with uh, with parliamentary politics and electoral work and so on and therefore we should avoid it basically what do, what do you think about that there certainly are such dangers to an enormous degree parliament more than anything else would present such dangers it would be a cat it can be a catalyst a very powerful catalyst for the degeneration of a revolutionary party if it gets seats there um so we have to take all of that very seriously we don't disagree with with a lot of those points in a sense um but really the content of those arguments from ultra left is essentially it's like someone who says there's a danger of going outside so, you know you could uh, there's all kinds of problems not only are there criminals and there's there's cars that could run you over but there's also you know the danger of getting rejected in love and you know <laughs> losing your job and all so better not to just not uh, do we don't disagree that those dangers exist and life is full of difficulties and suffering but you have to go out there and you have to live it and uh, that's really essentially what they're saying 
but I would say, yeah, Parliament more than anything else, it is a it is a powerful catalyst for degeneration because uh, it is a, a bourgeois Parliament. It's a talking shop to a large extent. It's it's in a, it's a very rarefied atmosphere. Mm. There's the constant pressure, day to day pressure, um, in that environment um, from other parliamentarians and. Uh, there's the, there's also the fact that you, we you would use Parliament, especially if you've got more than one AP, MP. If you've got several MPs, you would have to use it to fight for the working class. Of course, you would try and get reforms passed, and, and then you could obviously use that to show, oh, look, we fought for the workers and we've won this. Of course, you would not just go there and do nothing or just yeah. sort of rail against it. You would have to show, well, you know, we do want to fight for the working class. But with that comes the danger of thinking, step by step gradually think, yeah actually you know this is the way and mm. if we just preserve these seats and if we just make a little compromise here or there uh, then it'll be easier for us to pass certain legislation and, and step by step over time you can begin to see that the house so to speak the institution of parliament you begin to see yourself as a member of it fundamentally mm. and there is that atmosphere in parliament isn't there of like you see it sometimes between the different parties that they they see themselves as more than they're members of a party they see themselves as re members of the house with its with its traditions so yes all of that's true right but but um one way or another if you're going to build a serious if you're going to build a powerful revolutionary organization that's going to bring the working class to power that's going to overthrow capitalism which is the point, right? There's no point in doing any of this if ultimately we've no intention of doing that. If you're going to do that, then sooner or later, you've got to get stuck in and you've got to take risks and you've got to you know, lead movements and all of that carries big pressures and big dangers. And it's not unique to Parliament. It may be stronger mm -hmm. a, a danger in Parliament, but there's, there's the same sort of thing in, in every walk of life as like a trade revolution. Trade union work, for example. Trade industry. union work. In some ways, that's even worse because it's a kind of day-to-day -day grind, you know, of like this little, you know, reform here or there. I've got to represent this worker in a, in a grievance case, you know. I've got to... And of course, you should do those things, but it's not that we're opposed to doing that. But with that comes the sort of... You can get worn down by that and you can get demoralized. I remember my... I, I was in a, a trade union branch. It was generally run by the left it was you know good trade unionists but there was a cynicism amongst them towards the membership because mm -hmm. basically i remember one of them once saying you know if they don't turn up uh, to our agm in other words if the members the rank and file don't turn up in sufficient numbers to the agm mm -hmm. i'm going to i won't i'm going to tell them i'm not going to bother to represent represent you <laughs> if your manager bullies you next time and what did that show that a cynicism because they felt like we're doing this slog day in day out and the members can't be bothered to show up, right? So I'm not going to be bothered to, to fight for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, in other words, a demoralization can set in from that day-to-day -day work. And because of the pressure or from the bosses. Also, I remember, again, when I was a representative, when I was a shop steward, I was, you know, on the bottom level of, of, of the workforce. I was a new employee. But suddenly, because I was a shop steward, I was invited to the head office <laughs> to have negotiations with the management, right? Alongside other shop stewards, it wasn't just me. But And suddenly, all the top managers knew who I was, um, which never be, would have been the case before. And you got tea and biscuits, and they spoke to you in a sort of respectable way. And I also remember once finding out that of the managers, at least some of the sort of lower level managers in the workplace, a disproportionate share of them were former shop stewards. And mm. I could see why, because suddenly you you have that sort of step up. You're a more important person and you, you have, you know the other managers suddenly, of course, from being on the other side of the barricade, so to speak. But you can see how that would sort of chip away at your revolutionary politics over a number of years. Um, and of course, going on television, uh, you know, if we, like Fiona did, you get invited onto these these shows or if, you know or if you have perhaps a column in a newspaper that also carries with it a pressure of mm. you know you're you're you sort of chatting with these these kind of people you know you're you're moving in certain circles there's a pressure to be respectable there or realistic perhaps you'll lose your newspaper column if you if you don't tone it down a little bit all of these things carry similar pressures not exactly the same but there's similar pressures in all of these fields and the only way to combat it in the long run is to build a strong organization, by which I mean 
one that basically starts out from the ideas, right? From revolutionary ideas. You don't try, you basically don't try and run before you can walk. You don't try and gain, and, and unfortunately there's a lot of groups on the left, on the far left, that in one way or another are constantly doing that. And they're constantly looking for shortcuts. So that thing I talked about earlier of launching a sort of new mass party light, like left unity, uh, yeah. trying to cobble together forces to win a few seats in parliament. But the, the parties that have been doing that, they're not ready for it. They're very, very small organizations with no influence, but they're trying to become a sort of big force. You know, other people like they try and get a media career uh, outside of really building a party in an organization. Um, and they might start out with the best of intentions and with some decent ideas. But if they're just an individual or a couple of individuals, they're going to eventually succumb to that environment. Um, and uh, so the only thing you've got to start out by by building a powerful revolutionary party, not looking for for influence and positions or anything like that, but just looking to recruit people who are open to revolutionary ideas and educating them, which means studying the history of the movement, studying uh, you know former revolutions and where the mistakes were made and what the pressures were, and 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 learning you know up and down the organisation all, all about these ideas and this history learning in practice as well and correcting one another you know uh, having discussions and debates holding each other to account if you like if we do that which is what we have been doing and, and we, we build up in that way then that means that our people who might get in you know, like get, get a position somewhere uh, and have a certain role play a leading role will be much stronger and they'll also have a, an organization around them that will be able to resist these pressures much better. They'll know what they're doing mm. and, and they won't have any illusions that, well, I've, if I just capture this position and hold on to it longer than that. No, for us, the position, of course, is it might be useful, but it's not the be all and end all mm. uh, because we've got a powerful organization which is growing. You know, That's the more important thing. If we all understand that and if we are articulate and we understand the ideas, we understand the history of revolutions and that sort of a whole approach, that's the only thing that will allow us to maybe, yeah, be in parliament and not capitulate or not begin to have illusions in parliament, you know, mm. and to understand, no, I, my role is as a, as a revolutionary, as a member of this party, and my job is to, to expose parliament, basically, mm. and, to, and, to con and why? But so that we can continue building and recruiting to this revolutionary organization, not so we can win more parliamentary seats, but to build a powerful organization on the streets and in the workplaces. That's the whole ethos. That's the whole. Mm. It's it's not easy, uh, and there's no guarantees. Of course, there's, but that's life. That's the class struggle. Of course, it's mm. not easy. Of course, there's enormous pressures. So that ultra left position, to me, it's basically it's an acknowledgement of the dangers and of the tendencies towards degeneration or moving to the right. And then it's basically saying, well, because those dangers exist, we won't do anything then. <laughs> we'll just stay away from everything. And they think that anyone who says, no, we must get stuck in, they think, well, that must mean that you are already a sort of traitor in waiting. You're already down the path, the slippery slope to becoming a reformist. When in reality, no, we just, we know those dangers are real. We don't pretend they're not real. But we know that we need to get stuck in. We need to build a powerful organization. We need to take positions sooner or later in trade unions, and maybe even in parliament because no serious or revolutionary organization can do without those things in the long run. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the, uh, the kind of uh, rejection of whether it be, you know, parliamentary politics, trade union politics on the behalf of the, the ultra left mm. is almost like the mirror image of the, the opportunistic fetishization of these institutions exactly. by the reformists in the sense that they both kind of, yeah, raise these things, uh, you know, above reality. They make them into this kind of, yeah, this fetish basically and kind of put the form before the content essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree that that's, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, reformists tend to think that, well, parliaments is all powerful fantastic thing that you mm. just get the right people in there and you can somehow uh change society right as if there isn't ruling class uh and then on the other hand the, the ultra lefts think it's an all-powerful terrible organization that's mm -hmm. just gonna destroy you so just don't go anywhere near it mm -hmm. um and uh, in reality of course yes it is a powerful organization that has its own characteristics but you can build a revolutionary organization that can go there mm. um and uh and remain true to itself. And I think that this mistaking of form for content, as you said, is, is very typical of ultra less because also we got to understand what really is, uh, what really is reformist and opportunist? Is it your formal position on parliament or on this or that party? 
or is it what you really say and do? And uh, the reason I say this is because I have noticed over the years, many times, organizations that on paper might seem to be to the left of us, you know, super revolutionary, never touch parliament, never touch a reformist, you know, never ever offer any support to the Labour Party or any other organization, maybe denounce the trade unions. You get groups that will have nothing to do with the trade unions as well. You see, and, uh, you know, I've seen these groups see so convinced of their revolutionary character in relation to us and then i've seen them give a speech at a demonstration <laughs> and i've listened to the speech and i've been, oh you didn't so you just capitulated <laughs> you didn't say anything revolutionary you didn't explain capitalism you didn't explain you know you just you just said wishy-washy vague stuff i remember recently uh, there was a little small demonstration um in in Hackney for for Palestine, which I was there for, and one of these groups was incredible. I know this group; they they denounce Parliament. They won't have anything to do with it. They've always denounced the Labour Party. Would have never ever would never dream of calling for a vote for the Labour Party, even when Corbyn led it. Um, and they gave this speech, this speech at this this demonstration for Palestine, and the content of their speeches was basically Palestine is Palestinian people are really lovely. They're just such a great <laughs> people, and they're so oppressed, and then. Israel is so so bad, and and then their their proof of how bad Israel is and how good Palestine is was to refer to UN resolutions that even the UN hey the UN says what Israel is doing is bad, <laughs> and that was it. They didn't say well why does Israel do this? Is it because it's capitalist? Is it because it's backed by American imperialism? And why does American imperialism? Because it's capitalist and it's got certain interests and capitalism is inherently greedy. Uh, and inherently about controlling the world and carving it up. They didn't make any of these points. Uh, they didn't say, well, how can we stop Israel doing what it's doing? It's just somehow, well, Israel is bad and we've got to militantly oppose it. And also regarding the UN, of course, you can refer to a UN resolution. It might uh, prove this or that point. But you also, if you're a revolution, you've got to point out that the UN is not our friend. The UN is an organization of imperialism. Mm. They didn't even touch on any of those points, they didn't even hint at them. But they never would touch parliament. Parliament is, you know. <laughs> and I, I've seen that so many times. That to me is, is, is sectarianism in a nutshell. It's, it's formalistic. It's not just that it's ultra left. It's, it's that it has its way of looking at things that the formal position that you adopt is everything. I've also seen other people, because we changed our name to the Revolutionary Communist Party, and because in the past we did support Corbyn, uh, they now think, oh, and we were known as sort of having that position on the Labour mm. Party. They now think that we The atheist, that's what they call it. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And they now think that we've just abandoned all of our principles, forgotten it, that we want to deny our history, and that we're just total opportunists, just jumping on this kind of communist bandwagon as they would see it, right? They don't grasp that, no, we always, and if you look at our material on Corbyn, we always made the case for revolution. We always said that you've got to overthrow capitalism and that you need a revolutionary program and that if you get into power with Corbyn's program, you will actually, or Corbyn will actually get sort of, uh, will get defeated and won't be able to carry it out. We always made those points. Um, we were always a revolutionary organization uh, but of course, times change and you've got to uh, change with those times. You've got to, you know, you, this or that time, you might have a different approach to this or that party or this or that movement. But the key question really is, I mean, those are important. Those are tactical questions. But the key question is, are you a revolutionary organization? Do you understand how to explain to people in a concrete fashion the need for revolution? If Israel is attacking Palestine, of course, we have to oppose that. But are you, but lots of people oppose it. It, what distinguishes you as a revolutionary is that you can explain how this kind of thing is inevitable with capitalism mm. and that unless you know you have a revolu a powerful revolutionary movement that can overthrow the israeli state through by revolutionary means right unless you can explain that then you're not doing your role as a revolutionary organization and you may as well just be a kind of a liberal kind of opponent of israel right when and there's men many of those so yeah, that's that to me is sectarianism. It's that it's that it's that sort of lack of an understanding essentially, mm. and, and and substituting for substituting formal positions, formal denunciations of things for understanding and being able to explain 
really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, one of the last things that I want to ask then is in your article, you refer to this idea of the art of agitation. Mm. So I want to ask, yeah, what is that? Why do you refer to it as an art in particular? Yeah. It would be quite an interesting one. And above all, yeah, how, how do comrades of the RCP uh, learn how to acquire that, uh, that, that skill, would you say? Okay. Um, well, the art of, you know, there's many aspects to building a revolutionary organization. Obviously, the key thing is your theory, your ideas, your understanding. But that's not the be all and end all. That's the starting point. It's the most fundamental thing. But you've also got to be able to understand how to relate to specific situations. If you can only, if you go to a strike and you just say, we need revolution. I mean, you've always got to make that case to some in some way at some point. Of course, if you bury that, if you hide that, if you pretend that's not the case and that's very really bad, it's, you're failing. But if, if the only thing you can do is just turn up to some strike for like a 10% wage rise and just said, well, yeah, but we don't, we don't really need 10% wage, wage rise. What we need is revolution. That's, you know, you- It would make it very easy, wouldn't it, if that make it, Yeah, and also like, of course, it's obvious. It's not going to get anywhere. Um, and actually- you haven't really understood Marxism because Marxism isn't just an abstract position. It's, it, it's you know, we there's a reason why we think we need revolution, right? It, it relates to the struggle over wage rises and many other things. So you should be able to connect them anyway. But uh, yeah, there's more than just having that position. And yeah, there is an art to it. And what, what I mean by that is that you have to have a feeling for it, right? You can't be, if you're an artist, uh, if you're a painter, for example, you can't be a great painter by just having a formula. You know, there's, of course, there's technique, which you have to master, but there's something that you cannot just explain in a sort of textbook fashion that you have to have, you have to have a feeling for it. And that's a talent, but it also comes through practice and through, yeah. uh, yeah, through, through, through practice, you master it and you, 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 you adjust things and you get a good result. That's kind of how you also have to have that element to it. We have to try different things. You have to get stuck in and you have to have a feeling for what is the mood. Like I was saying earlier about this thing about the received wisdom is you got to water your ideas down. There's a number of problems with that. There may be times in which that would work, however, uh, even if it's wrong, I would say this time is not one of those. This time is one where if you put yourself as a directly revolutionary force, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll win the election, but it means you will have a lot of success at cutting through and winning support and et cetera. And you've got to have a feel for that. You know, you've got to feel this sort of um, what the mood is and what, what kind of, what slogans connect with that and what methods, you know, and again, you've got to get, get stuck in. You can't know that in advance. When we ran this campaign, of course, I think the whole pitching of the campaign in the first place was an expression of this, this feeling, this art, you know, this sense that it, this is a good opportunity. A lot of things have come together. But on top of that, as we ran the campaign, we realized certain things were more successful than others for what we wanted to achieve. For example, door knocking is a good idea. You know, canvassing, going knocking on every door in the constituency, saying, "Have you voted? Would you, would you do so?" Uh, which is the normal method of the Labour Party and other 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 parties. It might be very good for getting you to win seats, but what we found is that that's okay. But if you want to really discuss with people and win them over to revolutionary ideas, which is what we're interested in more than the, the vote. Uh, Knocking on doors is less good. A lot of people don't answer the door. A lot of people are in the middle of cooking. <laughs> they're isolated. They're you know maybe they're looking after their kids. That sort of thing. It's not very conducive. I mean, in, in some cases, of course, you have a great conversation, but we found that having little mini demonstrations throughout the borough and giving speeches and you know that was really good. It energized people. You'd meet people. They'd come together. So that's an art. That's something that you pick up through the experience and you get a feel for it. Um, theory obviously takes you so far. It gives you, that is fundamental because we need to, sometimes you get people think, oh, you don't really need theory. It's just a sort of, you know, it's an interesting thing, but what we need is to win things here and now. I've had people say that we just need to get in and do good things. Uh, but yeah, sure. But, you know, theory is not as it, such people don't seem to realize that well, theory will tell you what you can and can't achieve though. Uh, you might win an election, you might get to sort of do a couple of things, but it's Marxist theory that's going to tell you uh, the limitations to parliament and the, you know, mm. the economic conditions, etc. Anyway, uh, so theory is fundamental, but you've got to have that art. And 
yeah, there's nothing, you can't really, there's no formula to it. So I'm struggling a little bit to sort of explain why. I mean, it's just a case of getting involved and, uh, and discussing and learning from one another, seeing what works. And obviously some people have more of a talent for it than others, but the most important thing is to gain that experience and that discussion mm -hmm. and get stuck in practically. And, uh, you know, this or that thing will work better than another, even if the political content is the same between them, but one of them has just somehow manages to connect better. Thanks for that. And yeah, the last question that I want to ask then is what is the RCP going to look like now that Fiona campaign, Fiona's campaign is over? Are we going to go election crazy and spend all of our time preparing <laughs> for 600 candidates in uh, 2020, whatever it will be? Or yeah, what, what's, your, what's your take on, on what no. our methods are going to look like in the, in the immediate period? No, yeah. of course not. Our <laughs> idea is not that, to, that our method now is just elections. Uh, we have to play that by ear and see how we grow. The main thing now is to, of course, continue building our, our organization. And that's what sets us apart from, from other groups who just want to get the seats. You know, We're more interested in these new branches that we're going to form in the area. Uh, Fiona's campaign has allowed us to get into touch with and recruit a, a much wider array of people than we had done before to really sink roots into the local community. And there's an article on our website about you know, work amongst Muslim women that has been very successful. We need to build upon that. Uh, we, yeah, we need to sort of transform our organization really into more of a of, of a of a campaigning organization. Um, and uh, because we're a bigger organization now, a much bigger organization. And of course, Fiona's got a certain name recognition and. Uh, yeah, so we need to we need to consolidate those gains. We need to recruit in the local community, and to become more of a point of reference mm -hmm. in society on the left, particularly amongst young people. Uh, we, but we also we need to focus on education as well. That's always been our forte. Obviously, if we recruit lots of people, we need to educate them. And I would appeal to any people listening to this interested in getting involved, do get involved. And if you do get involved, if you join us. And you got to learn what the ideas of, of Marxism are because that's what we're all about. So we're also going to concentrate on on educating our new members um, to build a stronger organisation so that we can go on and, and, and go forwards afterwards. Uh, we're then we're going to launch a campaign against imperialism. Of course, we anticipate the war in Gaza is uh, the, the barbarism of the Israeli military is, is, is going to continue. So we need to launch a, a, a big campaign nationally against that and against British involvement in it. Um, and of course, when the students start at university again, we anticipate a lot of big meetings amongst students against uh, uh, Israel and against British imperialism. So we're going to launch a campaign on, along those lines. Obviously, the details haven't been worked out yet. Um, uh, but going forwards beyond the next few months, yeah, we need to become a much more powerful organization. This government that we now have is deeply unpopular already. If you look at the polls, people or before we even voted for them didn't like Starmer. The overwhelmingly main reason for voting for the Labour Party was just to get rid of the Tories. So he's, and he's obviously going to carry out austerity. I mean, we can already see that. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Um, capitalism demands it and they are absolutely pro-capitalist. Uh, that's the whole reason that Starmer's there. Uh, he's the man uh, for capitalism in the Labour Party, if you like. Um, and they're determined to be a safe pair of hands for it. So they're going to carry out a pro-austerity agenda for sure. And that's going to cause big struggles. It's going to cause massive discontent at the Labour Party. We can anticipate big strikes. Um, so yeah, there's going to be huge discontent there. But who's going to mop up that discontent? Who's going to become the lightning rod? Who's going to become the uh, the opposition? The Tories will obviously may pick up some support because they are obviously the, the other big party, but they're going to be hugely discredited. They are hugely discredited. They've had the worst election result in their history. They're also going to be tearing each other apart in their election campaign. So I think they'll struggle to pick up despite the the the, the decline in the Labour Party that we'll quickly see. Uh, Reform UK obviously could become sort of seen as the opposition they're just going to try and pose themselves in that way on a reactionary basis obviously they're not going to pose any kind of left-wing criticism of, of the Labour government and that's explosive then we're going to have Trump in power most likely 
uh, that's obviously going to be really explosive. There's likelihood of economic crisis around the corner. The US economy is probably going to go into crisis. It's going to be a very, very explosive time. Mm. And at a colossal vacuum, particularly amongst young people, nobody, you know, standing up for them, nobody opposing this Labour government from the left, no real point of reference for them. And of course, I don't think we're big enough to become that yet. We're not big enough to fill that vacuum, but we are becoming a more powerful organization. And we, and also the, this parliament is five years. Of course, I think it's, there's a good chance the government would actually collapse before then, but, you know, because it will be a real crisis government. Uh, Starmer could be deposed as leader of the Labour Party. But, um, you know, the, the question is, what will we look like in five years' time? We're growing very rapidly. But what kind of force will we have in five years? Mm. Um, not obviously a force big enough to, to stand in, in 600 seats and to become a new government. That's not <laughs> what I'm suggesting. But will we be strong enough to become a real point of reference and to really become a magnet for these radicalized young people and to, to be seen as these are the people who are fighting. These are the people who are posing a, a revolutionary alternative and it's, and it's a viable one. It's, a, it's actually a sizable organization. Okay, I want to join that. I want to help build that organization. We are beginning to be, be become a bit like that, but we need to be bigger still. We need to be much bigger still. Mm. And of course, don't have a crystal ball. I can't see how it will all pan out. But yeah, we need to be a fighting organization. We, we also need to continue to be an organization that places ideas and education at the, f f at the heart of what we do as well uh, to build such a, to have a strong core and to know what we're doing uh, and to know, to, 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 to not degenerate as, you, as we were discussing. But, you know, yeah, we need to, to, to become this, this more, much more powerful fighting organization. I think in the next period, we can really begin to become that and become that point of reference. And that will be a, that will be a real game changer in society, right? Mm -hmm. To have for the first time in a very, very long time, a, a, a revolutionary organization worth its salt. You know, one that isn't just sort of there on paper, but it's there in every community, right? In, in all of the trade, active in all of the trade unions up and down the country, organizing people, mobilizing people with energy, that's what we, we we need to become. I think that's what we will become. And I would appeal to anyone listening to this to join us in building that to, 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 because we need that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just in Britain. Everywhere you see this enormous discontent, this huge crisis of capitalism. But there's just no one saying anything, you know, no one saying anything revolutionary or, or, or to the left. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what we're going to become. And that's, that's going to completely change the situation when, when we when we have that sort of force mm. yeah i think that's a that's a really good note to end on i would say and uh, yeah i would say to all of our listeners uh, and our supporters if you think this has been an interesting discussion if you agree with the ideas that we've put forward and most of all if you want to help us become that that point of reference that fighting visible party that can attract workers and young people uh, you know in the future and also now not just in britain but across the world then yeah as as dan said we implore you uh, we, we really urge you to get involved in the revolutionary communist international which has sections uh, across the world um and yeah, and get involved in, in, in the struggle, first of all, by educating yourself in, in, in Marxist ideas. We have a, a bunch of resources that will help you to do that. We have our newspaper, our magazine in defense of Marxism, which you can subscribe to using the link below. We have many different uh, articles and so on on our website. And yeah, but also by getting stuck in to the, the task of, of recruiting to the party, of building a branch wherever you are, all of these different things going on to demonstrations, strikes to raise our ideas and to raise a Marxist program. That is what is in store for you if you sign up uh, today. So if you head to the link in the show notes of this podcast, you can uh, get in touch with your nearest branch of the RCP. And as well as that, you can also subscribe to our newspaper, our magazine, and also donate to the party uh, as well. Um, so yeah, with all that said, I'd like to thank uh, our listeners for, for tuning into this discussion and make sure you stay tuned to Marxist Voice for future discussions on Marxist theory, revolutionary history, uh, party building and current events as well, uh, brought to you by the Revolutionary Communist Party. 